Where's the bring back the bison? Coffee? What? Did you have your own? No, not, no. I'm sorry, where, now that the buffalo's gone. Oh, they're right here. I had. It's right here. Oh, you put it on. She was the wrong one to go grab her. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Welcome on this beautiful, mostly sunny October day to the North Parish of North Andover, a Unitarian Universalist congregation serving the Merrimack Valley and beyond. My name is Cara Fresino. I'm currently serving on the Board of Trustees, and I will be your worship assistant today. I would also like to offer a warm welcome to our guest preacher today. Claire Carl Miller from UU Mass Action. Welcome to our special service as we observe Indigenous Peoples Weekend. 
It is really good to see you all, to be together here this morning. It's good to see the children and youth. Here are only two more weeks until our Halloween party at North Parish. Welcome to this day in which we are alive and awake and breathing. Here we are, the result of four billion years of life on Earth, 250 million years of mammals and 50,000 years of humanity. Here we are on a small planet in a galaxy of 100 billion stars in a universe of two trillion galaxies. We are miracles of life and evolution and energy. If you are a pagan, an agnostic, a religious naturalist, a Jew, an atheist, a humanist, a theist, a curious Christian, or a plain old Unitarian Universalist, welcome. If you are something else or nothing in particular, welcome. Whether you come seeking peaceful practices, joyful community, or justice, oriented companions, welcome. Whoever you are, however you are, wherever you are, whomever you love, we are glad you're here. Let's take a moment and turn to each other and say good morning and welcome. All right, if we are well greeted, our opening words are by Robin Wall Kimmerer, botanist, author, professor, and member of the citizen Potawatomi Nation. Action on behalf of life transforms. Because the relationship between self and the world is reciprocal, it is not a question of first getting enlightened or saved and then act. As we work to heal the earth, the earth heals us. Let us join in singing our opening hymn, number 155, Circle Round for Freedom in the Gray Hymnal, and we'll sing it through twice. Number 155. Again, good morning and a special welcome to any newcomers and to those joining us by Zoom. I can see you down here on the screen. I could go on tiptoe, though. <laughs> if you are a newcomer, you'll find uh, visitor cards like this in the pews. If you'd like to fill one out and put it in the collection plate, um, they're also in the back at the doors as well. And you put it in the collection plate or hand it to an usher. Our collection today will be for our October outreach and will go to the North American Indian Center of Boston, which you can read about in your order of service. Members from North Andover are involved in their new indigenous agricultural initiative with native crops and food sovereignty. And a, and a, a truly exciting project and 
worthy of our generous support. We ask that everyone put their phones in worship mode, and we often show applause using American Sign Language like this. And we do have an elevator, which is through these doors to my right. Your left. Today we are delighted to welcome guest preacher Claire Carl Miller back to the North Parish Pulpit. Claire Carl is the coordinator of the statewide Justice Coalition Mass Power Forward, which they co-founded in 2015. They are also the movement's building director and staff lead for Indigenous Solidarity at UU Mass Action, an organization which mobilizes the 1,000 Unitarian Universalists and 142 UU congregations in Massachusetts to confront oppression and engage in the legislative process. North Parish has made a commitment to be a partner congregation with UU Mass Action, and we are grateful Claire Carl could join us today. Please join us immediately following the service today in the chapel for Justice Soup. We will have a light lunch and learn about justice teams at North Parish, as well as UU Mass Action Priority Legislation for Indigenous Justice with Claire Carl, and all are welcome. Also, this Saturday, Canadian Indigenous artist Crystal Shawanda and her band will be playing at Crossroads at 8 p.m. Read about it in your order of service and come out to enjoy the concert. I know I already have my tickets. <laughs> and those are our announcements. I'm going to invite Aaron up to the pulpit. Before we light our chalice, I would like to share a land and labor acknowledgement, which comes from UU Mass Action. We acknowledge that we are on the unceded territories of the Massachusetts, Mohican, Nauset, Nipmunk, Pawtucket, Pocanucket, Pocomtuck, the Wabanaki Confederacy, including the Penacook and Wampanoag peoples, and that many indigenous peoples still live here. We honor and recognize the black and African people whose unpaid and forced labor built this country and our commonwealth and this town. We celebrate and work in solidarity with black, indigenous, and people of color organizations leading the movement for our collective liberation in line with our eight principal commitment. So I would now like to invite Jeremy and Raphael uh, forward to ring our bell of mindfulness and to light our chalice, this ancient symbol of communion and equality of mystics and heretics, reformers and refugees, artists and activists, and Unitarian Universalists everywhere. Would the congregation join us in our child slaying words found in the order of service or in the chat on Zoom? Life is a gift for which we are grateful. We gather in community to celebrate the glories and the mysteries of this great gift. We invite the children forward um, for time for wonder with Suzanne. Come on up. Son of all ages, come join me, please.
So who here knows what the fifth UU principle is? Anybody? Anybody? Bueller? I'll tell you, it's the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process. And when we teach that to children, we say, all people have a say. Because it's really important for everyone to, get, to make decisions about what affects them. So Monday is Indigenous Peoples Day. That's tomorrow. A day when we celebrate the cultures and histories of Native Americans. In honor of Indigenous Peoples Day, I wanted to tell you a story I just learned about how some Native Americans are reclaiming their right to decide for themselves about something very basic and important to everyone, and that's the food that we eat. Can you imagine not being able to choose what kind of food you eat and have somebody else tell you what you have to eat and what you can't eat? Well, that's what happened to some Native American people. So a long time ago, in many parts of this country, Native Americans ate acorns as part of the diet. Now, please don't go outside and start eating acorns because they're not, they're not good like that and they're not good for you. You have to, you can't just pick them up and eat them. You have to um, prepare them in just the right way. And for many native people, acorns were an important part of their culture and their food source. And, and it was a lot of work and it took a lot of time to prepare them so that they were good to eat. Um, but they did it together as a community like we do here at North Parish. So when Europeans came to America, that changed for many Native American communities. And sometimes the Europeans forced them off their land where the acorns were into new lands where they couldn't get any more acorns. Because not all trees make acorns, right? And then sometimes because the Europeans thought their way was the best way, they told Native people they were not allowed to make this traditional food anymore. <coughs> and so then the elders weren't able to, get, to teach them how to cook the foods and they lost the right to decide for themselves what foods they could eat. And that's not a very loving way to be, is it? No. Well, this went on for a long time, but eventually things started to change because our indigenous friends and their friends had a dream that things could be more fair and loving. As a part of this, they are relearning how to eat foods they used to eat so they can choose for themselves. So I just read a story about a Native American woman in Oregon named Jessica who went to eight guys to go to acorn camp? Like what would you do at acorn camp? They gather acorns and then they, they get together with people, older people who know how to cook them properly and um, make them edible. And did you know different acorns from different trees have different flavors? That's pretty cool, I think. So by learning how to do this, she and many people like her are saying, that they get to choose how they want to live and what they want to eat. And this is called food sovereignty. And it's an important movement for justice today. Now, a different Jessica here at North Parish, she's very awesome. She made you guys beautiful acorn necklaces that look like this. They're acorn caps and marbles, and I think they're beautiful. And she wants you to wear them, and they're in your mailboxes, so be sure and check your mailboxes before you leave today. Um, and what I want these to remind you guys of is that we should always work for everybody to have um, the right to, have, to say, have a say on things that affect them, okay? Can you guys do that? Okay. Well, we're going to go to our classes now, and we're going to be doing more work on Indigenous Peoples Day and playing some games and doing some artwork. So um, if the congregation could please join me in singing the children out. We're singing Go Now in Peace, number 413 in the Gray Hymnal.
Our reading is by Rebecca Adamson of the Cherokee Nation from uh, First Nation Survival and the Future of the Earth. The interdependency of humankind, the relevance for relationship, the sacredness of creation is returning as a fact of life. It is ancient, ancient wisdom. More than any single issue, economic development is the battle line between two competing worldviews. Tribal people's fundamental value was with sustainability, and they conducted their livelihoods in ways that sustained resources and limited inequalities in their society. What made traditional economies so radically different and so fundamentally dangerous to Western economies were the traditional principles of prosperity of creation versus scarcity of resources, of sharing and distribution versus accumulation and greed, of kinship usage rights versus individual exclusive ownership rights, and of sustainability versus growth. Here ends the reading. We now enter into a time of meditation, contemplation, or prayer, beginning with the lighting of candles of remembrance, joys, and sorrows. If you'd like to share your joy or sorrow, uh, if you'd like me to share your joy or sorrow with the congregation, you can write it on one of the yellow slips of paper that you'll find in the pews and bring it forward during the music. Uh, you are also welcome to light a silent candle. You may want to use this time to follow your breath Repeat a centering word or the serenity prayer to remember those in mind and heart or to simply let the music wash over you. This pretty planet spinning through space your garden your harbor, your holy place. Go dance in the wind and gentle to and sorrows, including these. Catherine uh, writes that we are grieving the loss of her mother-in-law, Nancy, and her friend, Ellen, 
who was a painter and a social worker. Kim Adamai um, lights a candle for her friend's father, Costa, who passed on September 18th at the age of 90 and celebrates that they had uh, a long life. Kathy Backinson would like to remember and celebrate the life of her mother, Ann Donaldson, who died peacefully on Friday, September 29th at the age of 93. Her, their hearts go out to, our hearts go out to Kathy Ralph, Eric and Jeff, and the whole extended family. Janet Foley is asking for prayers and positive thoughts for her brother, Stephen, who is having thyroid surgery at, on Wednesday at Mass General. Deb Olander is lighting a candle of healing for Jacob John, a Unitarian Universalist and Indigenous activist from Spokane, Washington, who was shot in the chest while participating in a peaceful protest in New Mexico. The protest was about plans to reinstall a monument to a violent, uh, to um, a violent conquistador. Jacob remi remains in critical condition. Our hearts are with him and his family. I like the second candle for our joys and gratitude reading a candle of gratitude for indigenous climate activists everywhere. Lynn Wenzel lights a candle. Congratulations to Amanda Weldon and Mark Branzetti on their birth of their daughter, Bernadette Opal Branzetti. She will be called Birdie. She was born uh, October 6th. Amanda is the daughter of North Parish member Carol Weldon. And she came, Amanda came up through the ranks here, um, really close to my daughter as well. Lynn and Keith Wenzel are wishing a happy 29th birthday to their son, Matthew Wenzel. Nancy Stone Lenhoff is lighting a candle of gratitude that her sister Beth is with us today. Ben, Bree, and Noah are welcoming their niece, Adeline Charlotte, into the world this past Friday. Grateful for the health of mom and baby. And Kim Adam I would like to light a candle for the great talent that we had last Friday at the Moth Night. And for her grandson, Brody, who was dedicated here last Sunday. I light a third candle for the concerns and gratitudes we have for our wider world. And I light this last candle to represent the secret struggles of every person. May you join me in the congregational response printed in your order of service. In our joys and in our sorrows, may we walk in faith and trust with one another. I invite us to continue in the spirit of contemplation with a time of silence, followed by a meditation written by North Parish member Nancy Lenhoff. I invite you to take a mindful breath and to take another mindful breath deeper than your last one. I invite you to join me in this prayer about the earth and all her beings. 
tens of thousands of years ago, the first peoples walked on this continent, Turtle Island, their home. They lived sustainably, interbeing with the others, the animals and plants and minerals. The Penacook people once lived where the North Parish now calls home. Then English colonists settled in this land and took its riches. European settlers drove the first peoples away, and many thought they were completely gone. But the good news is that the first peoples live on. And while much was lost, not all was lost. The descendants of the first peoples live and love on this continent. The descendants of the colonial settlers live and love on this continent. The descendants of the kidnapped and enslaved live and love on this continent. Immigrants and their descendants live and love on this continent. May we weave our lives together that we might be stronger. May we learn how to live sustainably on this land as the first peoples did. Amen and blessed be. Again, our outreach offering is for the North Parish American Indian Center of Boston and the work they do to empower the Native American community. Checks may be made out to North Parish with outreach, October outreach in the memo line. You may also give through the website under the Give menu, and the offering will now be gratefully received. May we be generous as we are able. As part of our commitment uh, to the eighth principle of the UUA, um, one of the things this congregation is doing is uh, reframing really what is sacred, how we celebrate certain kinds of holidays, um, Indigenous Peoples Day slash Columbus Day, Thanksgiving um, in the fall. And another piece of that commitment is centering um, historically marginalized voices. Today we are hearing from um, indigenous people. Um, Buffy St. Marie, a uh, Canadian uh, indigenous person, a uh, Grammy Award winning songwriter um, and indigenous activist uh, um, uh, is the voice we are offering you here. Can you remember the time that you have held your head high and told all your friends of your Indian claim. Proud good lady and proud good man, some great great grandfather from Indian blood sprang, and you feel your heart for these ones. Oh, it's written in books and in that we've been mistreated and wronged. Well, over and over I hear those same words from you, good lady, and you, good man. Well, listen to me if you care where we stand and you feel you're part of these ones. When a war between nations is lost, Loser, we know pays the cost. But even when Germany fell to your hands, consider, dear lady, consider, dear man, you left them their pride and you left them their love. 
little change come about, Uncle Sam? Or are you still taking our lands? A treaty forever George Washington signed. He did, dear lady, he did, dear man. And the treaty's been broken by the kings who are damned. And what will you do for these ones? Oh, it's all in the past, you can say. But it's still going on here today. The government now wants the Iroquois land, that of the Seneca and the Cheyenne. It's here and it's now you can help us, dear man, now that the buffalo's gone. Beautifully done. It's never fair for me to follow the songs. It moves me so much. Good morning, and thank you so much for the invitation to return. My name is Claire Carl. I use they, them pronouns, and I'm the movement building director at Unitarian Universalist Mass Action. This morning, I want to talk about the problems facing us, how solidarity for indigenous justice is a core antidote, and some of the key ways this work is happening. Before I get into that, I have to ground into who I am in the context of this story. I am one of those descendants of settler colonists. I still am a settler colonist here on Turtle Island. And based on my research and DNA tests of my grandparents, I am 11 kinds of European. I'll name them to place myself. I am Irish, I am Welsh, I am Scottish, I am English, I am French, I am German, Danish, Norwegian, Swedish, and of the Balkans. Since I was a child, I've been attracted to Native American culture. I think of myself as nose pressed up against the glass of indigeneity. I was that kid at the mall who always wanted to go into the store with the dream catchers, the t-shirts with the wolves on them. And as an adult, I've come to think of that in part because I'm extremely unhappy living under colonialist racial capitalism here. I'm often lonely, I'm stressed about money, my health, my family's health, the climate, the state of our democracy, just to name a few. Perhaps you are also unhappy with these things. I'm grateful to name them in your company because it's so much easier to face that together. At UU Mass Action, we define the root of all of these problems as colonialist racial capitalism. Apologies for the jargon. So let me describe it. Colonialist racial capitalism is the dominant worldview that we live in. It is the never-ending, profit-driven extraction of wealth and exploitation of land and people and it's made possible by anti-blackness, white supremacy, and the erasures of indigenous people. This exploitation of wealth, these systems of oppression, they make it okay for some people on land to be sacrificed. I remember seeing this all too clearly, especially in the early years of the pandemic when Frontline workers, medical personnel, bus drivers, grocery workers, many of whom are low income and people of color, weren't protected. Sure, I put up a lawn sign with everyone else with a heart thanking them, but that's really not the same 
as actual policies that would have limited exposures. Those groups of people were considered more okay to go out and be exposed. So this is the reality we live in. This is the dominant system on our planet at this time. But it's not the only one. Last year I read this book. I highly recommend it. I'll save it and share it later if you want to take a picture of the cover. It's called Restoring the Kinship Worldview. Indigenous Voices Introducing 28 Precepts for Rebalancing Life on Planet Earth. It's incredible. It lays it out. Restoring the Kinship Worldview. There are an estimated 370 million indigenous people spread out across 70 countries worldwide. And they are by no means a monolithic group. There is lots of diversity. They're not living exactly the same. But there are common threads that this book touches upon. Threads that I think make an indigenous worldview the antidote to the current dominant worldview. One precept in particular has stuck with me ever since I read it. It's the chapter called Generosity as a Way of Life. Hmm. Did you know that when Christopher Columbus arrived in the Dominican Republic, he was so confused by the generosity of the Taino peoples he encountered there and later murdered and enslaved. That he wrote back in a letter to the king of Spain, King Ferdinand, he wrote, they're so naive and so free with their possessions that no one who has witnessed it them would believe it. When you ask them for something they have, they never say no. gives me goosebumps to picture it. This European man who traveled across an ocean to exploit and take arrives in a culture of generosity where everything that he and his men asked for, they gave. It's just heartbreaking when you think about that taking mindset meeting a group with a giving mindset. You can see where it landed. Take, 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 take. Not long after I read this chapter, I was up in New Hampshire with my partner being a tourist in a beautiful place. We were walking along Main Street, drifting in and out of stores, getting a bite to eat. And I walk into one of these shops, and as soon as I walk in, the woman behind the cash register visibly lights up. She looks at me and goes, where did you get that hat? It's beautiful. And I had just recently got the hat. I was honestly very blasé about it. <laughs> and so I just, I just took it right off. And I said, oh my god. I want you to have this. And you should have seen the look on her face. She was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I wasn't asking you for your hat. And I'm like, I, I know. <laughs> but you so clearly love it. I want you to have it. And we did this like weird dance for like longer than I expected. <laughs> um, it was almost heartache that it was so hard for for the gift to happen. I don't know if you've had that experience before. But after I had given it to her and, and she had been able to accept it, there was just this beautiful feeling of warmth between us that has stuck with me. I felt like I had moved closer to who I want to be. Those of us living steeped, entrenched, marinated in this taker worldview can be unused to generosity. 
I've read so many accounts of this culture. There are some indigenous communities where there are rituals, where the leader, their leadership is gauged on how generous they are. There's celebrations where he, she, or they give away almost everything they have. And that's considered one of the highest displays of leadership. I like to imagine a Massachusetts entirely based on generosity. If you need affordable housing, we get it to you. If you need healthy food, we get it to you. Childcare, transportation, medical leave, disability support, you get my drift. We get it to you. What a relief that would be for me. To know that if the challenges you face or your loved ones to know that our collective, our common wealth, would be there to catch you, an actual safety net, perhaps. And I don't want to act as if none of this exists. It does. It exists right here. Think of our congregations as one of the places where generosity is still deeply cultivated and nourished. Last year, one of the board members at UUMass Action broke her leg. It was extremely challenging. She lives alone now, and she had recently acquired a puppy. <laughs> With a broken leg, she could hardly move herself about, let alone take care of this new young dog. But her congregation showed up. I remember reaching out to her to ask, how is it going? She told me that literally every walk her dog needed, someone in her congregation had signed up for. She was good. What if all of Massachusetts operated that way? What if our public policy had that type of value built into it? One of our priorities right now for our immigrant justice campaign is to ensure that incarcerated people can make cost free phone call. Imagine trying to ensure that people who are held in our prison industrial complex could have access to stay connected to their community, to family, to legal services, and to provide that assuming the best, not the worst. What if we always assumed a generous story? A Dakota elder Ella Deloria is quoted in this book contrasting these two systems, and I want to read to you it now because it, she just does it so well. The aim of the old Dakota economic system and that of the white man's are one and the same, as incongruous as that sounds when we compare the two systems for achieving it. Security. That was the aim. Food, clothing, shelter, and an old age free from want. All peoples need it. It is what they struggle for in their respective ways. But the two systems in question are irre irreconcilable. They go counter to each other. One says in effect, get, get, get now. All you can, as you can, for yourself. And so ensure security for yourself. If all will do this, then everyone will be safe. And this system depends on things, primarily. The other said, give, give, give to others. Let gifts flow freely out, and they will flow freely back to you again. In the universal and endless stream of giving, this is bound to be so. And that system depend is primarily dependent on human beings, friends, relatives. Given the future we face, it's easy for me to choose which system I prefer. And here in Massachusetts, we have a long way to go to have a society grounded in an indigenous worldview. You, Mass Action, is part of the Mass Indigenous Legislative Agenda with leadership from the North American Indian Center of Boston, receiving your plate share today. 
as well as the United American Indians of New England, who are the organization that runs the National Day of Mourning. Massachusetts, in many ways, is one of the ground zeros for settler colonization in North America. The Massachusetts people, the Wampanoag people, the Nipmuc, people here have been oppressed for more than 400 years. Think about that compared to you know, the Zapatistas in Oaxaca who have an autonomous zone within Mexico where they're completely living their values. I mean, my gosh, we are far from that. We have a long way to go. But as part of the mass indigenous legislative agenda, we have five policies that would move us closer. They're no-brainers. I'll just run through them very quickly. Number one, replace Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day statewide. <laughs> right? No brainer. Let's prohibit the use of Indigenous people as mascots. Right? No brainer. <laughs> Let's consult with Native tribes to create curriculum in our public schools that actually teaches and celebrates accurately about indigenous people. Let's establish a commission to look into the educational outcomes of Native children in our public schools. <coughs> and lastly, let's ban the selling for profit of sacred cultural objects. Very simple policies. Um, you know, I think about my other hat where I'm on our climate team and, and those policies, I can't usually explain in one sentence. <laughs> These are not revolutionary, but they are necessary. They are critical stepping stones in Massachusetts towards an indigenous worldview, just like a land acknowledgement is a first step. We acknowledge that the land was stolen now what? Now we work towards bringing it back to an indigenous stewardship, moving forwards together towards a generous future. I want to begin to land this talk by reminding us of all of our stake in this work. That dominant worldview is destructive, it's harmful, and no one is doing well. As I mentioned before, while I am enormously grateful, I have joy, I have abundance in my life, I'm also deeply unhappy. And I invite you to sometimes tap into that if you don't already. Tap into the ways that you are deeply unhappy under the status quo. To think about the ways in which this scarcity system also stresses you, perhaps, about money, housing, health care. The prospect of raising children where there are many adults around who are confused about gender, about sexual orientation, about consent. It is a wonderful time to be alive, but it is also sometimes a scary one. When we work towards an indigenous worldview, we work towards a generous future. And that's just one of the 28 chapters in this book. There's also going to be connection to land, to ancestors, delight, and full support for young people, as well as elders. There's going to be rest, there's going to be humor, interdependence, Emphasis on truthfulness and gratitude. I want the whole thing. That's the vision that keeps me going. Trying to run around, clean up the mess of climate change, clean up the mess of our democracy. That part's important, but it's also exhausting. Having this vision of a life-giving world, that's what keeps me going. And I want to be clear, when I talk about moving towards an indigenous worldview, I don't mean going backwards to some version of 
what the Penacook were doing on this land in the 1400s. That's not what I mean. We're still going to have internet and showers. <laughs> but I mean arranging our civilization around kinship, around love and connection. And I think most of us, most of our movement is already engaged in this work, but maybe not seeing it or naming it as part of this paradigm shift to an indigenous worldview. And I think it's critical that, you, that we, that I, <laughs> name it in that way. Because it's not just a little tweak here or like a shift there. It's an entire world view. And I'm very hopeful that we can do it. This past summer, I went to Germany where 20 of my 32 great, great, great grandparents were born. I went looking for roots. And I did find roots, but I did not find indigeneity. I was reminded that Europe was colonized first, colonized itself. And I found myself ironically grateful to be born in the US, to be in a place where there is indigenous leadership right up next to me at these amazing organizations at the State House. I thought to myself, huh, we could really make some big leaps because we have that vision closer. So I hope you'll join me in cultivating this vision. To join with UUMass Action, I have brought interest cards with me again today as I have the last couple times. You're always welcome to fill one out. And as mentioned, I will be after the service for Justice Soup. And we'll be talking specifically about Indigenous Peoples Day and the legislative agenda. Thank you all so much for sharing this space together. Please join us in singing our closing hymn, Building a New Way, number 1017 in the Teal Hymnal.
As we close our service, I'd like to thank our guest preacher, Claire Carl Miller. Thank you also to our musicians, Kristen Leary, Kim Adami, Aaron Powleck, Carmen Peppicelli, and Melissa White. Thanks also to the racial justice and climate justice teams for planning this service and all the work that they're doing. Our words of benediction are, again, by Robin Wall Kimmerer. We are showered every day with gifts, but they are not meant for us to keep. Their life is in their movement, the inhale and the exhale of our shared breath. Our work and our joy is to pass along the gift and to trust that what we put out into the universe will always come back. Blessed be. Put your roots down, put your feet on the ground. Can you hear what she says when you listen? Put your roots down, put your feet on the ground. Can you hear what she says when you listen? Cause the sound of the river as it moves across the stones is the same sound as the blood in your body as it moves across your bones. Are you listening? Yeah.